This is China Crossroads, the YouTube channel for China Crossroads, the in-person event in Shanghai, where I have hosted over 600 public talks in Shanghai over 13 years. Most of you probably know I'm Frank Tsai, who founded uh, China Crossroads. And uh, this content will be different from what you often see on YouTube or even in the global media. We will only host speakers I've hosted before in my events, and they all will have deep experience in China. So you'll hear the on-the-ground reality of China experts here in Shanghai. My co-host is Sven Agton, who is a prominent business person here in Shanghai and the author of several China business books. Um, and our guest today is Gabor Holch, who is a consultant for uh, expat managers in China, also the author of several books, uh, uh, most recently uh, Dragon Suit, The Golden Age of Expatriates in China, and we just hosted him um, a few months ago. He's spoken twice for us, and he's also written on uh, economic and political relations uh, between Asia and Europe and trained as a diplomat in his previous career. So, Really happy to have you here, Akabor. Frank Swen, really thank you for having me on the show. Well, to start off, uh, I've always thought that, you know, the relations between China and the world are very, very important, and it all depends on understanding, and that depends on people-to-people -people relations, right? So if you think about China and the world, the most important issue in the world now, that's three pillars. One is uh, trade and investment between China and the world, that's business people. One is all the Chinese who've uh, worked or studied abroad or are there abroad now. And the third, smallest, yet I think also very important pillar, is the, the, the small, relatively small group of expats who have uh, worked and lived in China. Uh, you've been uh, focusing on these people for a very long time in your career and have spoken to thousands of executives uh, uh, here in China. And i kind of like to get your insights on, you know, how has their sentiment been changing about working in China, and even uh, some of the bigger picture issues between China and the world in the last few years? Last few years is the time span here. Sure, last few years, yeah. All right, so um, yes, I mean, th these, these three pillars, we have to imagine them as a completely different sizes. So it, it, it goes from, from, let's say, the pillars from thickness to, uh, to thinness in the same order, the, the economy and the relations between China and the rest of the world. This is one. A very numerous Chinese community, it again depends on how far in time we go back. So are we talking about Chinese people who, who went abroad to study to work recently? Or do we even extend it to the several generations of Chinese communities that we have both in the East and the West? And then finally we have the, the foreigners, which is actually my livelihood. Because uh, as an intercultural consultant, intercultural coach, these are most of the, uh, the people that I'm working with. although. To, to look at it a little bit historically, again, in my profession, I came to China in 2002. I established my firm in 2005. I very soon find myself as a former expat kid and a former junior diplomat for international organizations, an executive coach for intercultural challenges, intercultural issues, mostly for Western executives dealing with mixed teams or local teams, basically running businesses in the Asia Pacific. But then in a couple of years, I found myself also specializing in Asia-Pacific local managers who are promoted to international positions in these international multinational, even Western multinational companies. So you can be a Japanese or a Filipino or a, or a, a Chinese manager who is promoted up to the level where you have international responsibilities. And then you are not an expat in China, but you are a multinational executive in China. Now, why I'm saying all this is because that last pillar is very thin. So if you look at it numerically, especially in a country like China, I, I often say a huge multinational, sorry, a, a huge local company, like for example, State Grid, which provides the electricity in China, has more employees than foreigners living in China. So this is, this is in, in statistical terms, it's an insignificant group in China. The percentage of residents in China who are foreign born almost negligible, it's like 0.05% at the time of the last census, and now it's less. Right. And yet, why is it so important? Because as many people know, China manages, let, let's be diplomatic here, manages the information that goes in and out of the country very, very carefully. And there are enormous biases on both sides about the respective other. So 
those people like all of us are who keep coming and going between China and the rest of the world, I think sometimes we just, we just want to cover our ears about what the media, business people, even men on the street says about China abroad and what Chinese people believe about the rest of the world. And, and this group that I call Dragon Suits, who are basically the uh, uh, international executives or managers or even entrepreneurs, or obviously the families of those people who work here, they are absolutely crucial because they have the experience, they have the empathy, they have Chinese friends, they, they willingly came to China and then they bring the news back to their own societies. The, the other side, Chinese executives abroad, Chinese expats as abroad, it's still just a trickle, so very, very few, especially if you compare it to the size of the country. But that's why the Chinese diaspora abroad is so important again. I have a question related to this. There is very often talk about the old China hands, later 20, 25 years. Mm. I am one of these people. Right. Well, I would think I need to, what I learned 20 years ago about China is completely irrelevant because the country changes every five years. You have to readjust and reinvent every five years. And I always have the feeling that these old China hands talking about the Guanxi, they have the network and those things. These are completely, in my opinion, completely overrated things. Mm. How do you look at that? How really is it important to have a old China hand on board? It depends on what you want. So um, one of the things that I'm struggling with as an, as an intercultural leadership consultant is that people who in theory should be prepared to solve very complex and very practical problems in this country, they prepare themselves for completely misguided sources. So, so they, uh, they prepare themselves from uh, Confucian ideology and, uh, and, and these kind of yin-yang ideas about China or uh, how China worked uh, 35, 40 years ago, uh, you know, the party state, the state-owned companies and so on. Or they prepare themselves from how just a pocket of China works, for example. They, they read books by somebody who lived in Beijing and then they imagine the rest of China is, is like Beijing. And Guangxi is actually one of those pet peeves of mine as well. So I think we share that. Literally the word Guangxi, it just means connections. But when it comes up, uh, comes up in international publications, usually it means this kind of smart network of uh, people helping each other. Now, there are two kinds of Guangxi's. One of them is the tradi traditional Confucian idea of Guangxi. That is based on blood relations or kinship based on where you were born. Uh, foreigners, even if they bend over backwards, they are not going to be part of this Guangxi. The very notable examples is the couple of people who come in with a foreign passport or with Chinese heritage, but actually let's say two or three generations down the road, they did come from Jiangsu or they did come from Beijing or, or they were part of one of the old clans of, Xiao, of, of Zhejiang uh, province or something like this. And then the other side is the kind of Guangxi that foreigners try to build for themselves. But actually uh, in the, in the pre-podcast chat, we, we were talking about this. I actually write in the book that most of the foreigners who tell me they are very proud of their Guangxi skills, they so-called Guangxi with other foreigners. And maybe some of those Chinese people who, are, who speak their language, who are in, this, in their immediate environment. So I, I don't think that we can, uh, how do you say, uh, we should put too much emphasis on it. But to know that this is the case is very important. Because actually a lot of, uh, most foreigners, they live in a kind of bubble, top tier cities, multinational companies. You, you basically have to build up your business and relationships like you would have to build it up in the, in the Middle East or in Paris. So if, if I'm being sent by a foreign company right. or any foreigner comes to China, whatever, just live a long term, long time, how, would you, who, how, would, how could you prepare them basically? Because a lot of these tradings are based on Guanxi and stuff from the old days, but how should a foreign company or anybody prepare themselves before coming? What is the really thing you really need to understand about how to live here and be successful? Right. It depends on who we are talking to again. So um, I wish everybody asked me this question. There are, there are two scenarios that I work in. Number one, let's say the HR director asks me, how do I prepare this person who is soon going to China? This would be an ideal situation for, for my job. The other one is when the manager, him or herself asks me, and very often when they are already in the country, uh, how do I prepare for doing business in China? It's much, it's, it's much more fortunate 
if this question comes up before they select the person to go to China. Because one huge misunderstanding in large organizations, and I'm not just talking about multinational companies, academia, media, um, diplomatic organizations as well, is that, they, is that they see the China posting as a promotion, basically a step up, just like they would make you let's say, the head of a business unit after you're head of a department, right? Because China is bigger, China is, is, is high visibility. So basically, China is a promotion. But they make these decisions based on track record, based on performance, not if this person's China compatibility is relatively high. And, and this, is, this is definitely a problem. Now, to be very honest with you, if you are temperamentally not uh, very suitable to, um, to work in China in a constructive way, which could happen, all you can do is create a buffer around yourself. And this is what actually not only the multinational companies do, but also the Chinese government is doing. So if you look at it, most of these multinational companies are bubbles, right? I mean, if you walk into the office tower of IKEA, or if you walk into the office tower of General Motors or Google, you feel you are surrounded by that corporate culture, which comes from the national culture of the, of the firm. And also, Shanghai itself is a kind of bubble because it's so significantly different from mainstream China. And what did the Chinese government do? Because they knew that it would be a huge shock for most foreigners to arrive in China at the time when China was opening up. They created these so-called special development zones where you can do international business relatively undisturbed. So you have multiple layers of buffer around you and I advise a lot of foreigners who are here for two or three years, don't be afraid to stay in that bubble unless you are really, really curious about what's out there. If um, we go a little bit earlier and we look at China compatibility, just please, please, <laughs> I'm looking at the camera now, <laughs> forget collectivism, forget Confucianism, forget these things because 95% of the foreigners who ever set foot in China lived in these four or five big cities like Beijing, Chongqing, Shanghai, uh, Guangzhou. People around you will be competitive, will be tough, will be straightforward, fast and flexible. Prepare yourself for that. Right. I mean, there's so many misconceptions to dispel for uh, people who are getting into China. Uh, as you know, I, I'm a PhD sociologist as well. And, uh, you know, not everything is culture. I, I like that the Guanxi discussion because um, Guanxi is important all around the world. If you look at the international indicators, China is not the highest on the importance of Guanxi. But also, I mean, think about the way that, you know, Westerners essentialize China. They think it's an unchanging, you know, thousands of years culture. And Chinese also, you know, say that too, which convinces them. But everything changes. And, right. you know, what is, what is Confucianism in China today? You know, it, you have to see how that relates to economic development, how people's lives are changing, uh, and all kinds of different factors, and the fact that we have a, a Leninist regime here too. Right. Well, you said a couple of important things yeah. here, Frank. The first one is that we are not necessarily um, to separate the cultural from the economic, because yeah. these realities in human life, they, they, they mingle together. So let, let me give you an example. Uh, one of the people that I interviewed for uh, the book, and, and, and you can read about uh, what I'm going to say to you, is, is somebody who worked for uh, PwC, uh, born in China, brought over to Australia, came back to China with PwC. And um, what he told me is very interesting. Why do Chinese people need Guanxi today? Why do they have to stick together? Why do they have to... Uh, help each other even find not so official avenues of solving problems because the social security system is weak. Right. So it's to find, to, to find a doctor, to find the right educator for your kids. You know, people have to stick together. And I always incorporate these realities in my coaching and my workshops and so on. So let me give you an example. Uh, I, I did a, a string of workshops and uh, I coached a couple of executives in a German company, an industrial firm that makes robots, mainly for the automotive industry, but other industries as well. And a very frequent problem comes up for international managers who manage Chinese people. They are impatient with salary raises. They are very aggressive with promotions. So why is that? And then you, then you come up, how can it be? We, we heard that Chinese people are harmonious, patient, obedient Confucians. So what is happening here? 
are they really not like that? Are they more like Americans? Is it why uh, affluent Chinese families send their kids to the United States to study? Well, yes and no. So just scratch the surface a little bit, and then you will find out Chinese people are so impatient with raises and promotions because a lot of people depend on them. Many of them are the one-child generation. They have to look at, I mean, they might have two children now, but they have to look at four grandparents who are aging, who don't have the right uh, social security. Very often you have to pay their um, health care basically in cash. You have to pay a lot of money for your kid's education. You, are, you still have the mortgage for your house, of course. You are impatient. You have to make your money now before your parents get so sick that they end up in constant care and you have to pay cash on the nail. Uh, this is not cultural reality, it's economic reality, but if you see on the surface level of impatient and dynamism, you scratch the surface and that classical Confucian, let me be a little bit judgmental, almost clan mentality of the family sticking together is still there. But as a foreigner, you are connected to it through several layers. So this is how the cultural and the economic are very, very intimately connected with each other. Right. And China's been growing at, what, 7, 8, 9% for a very long time. Right. Whenever you have huge growth, there's huge opportunities. Some people don't get those opportunities and uh, you feel anxious. And I think that also explains a lot of why things happen faster. Well, who are the yeah. ones who don't get the opportunities? I mean, the, the foreigners do get the opportunities. That, uh, this is the interesting thing, is that foreigners who live in China, um, among them the executives I interviewed and I coach, they have the opportunities in China because they got a better education than the average Chinese person. Yeah. They have their social security backing. They are expats. Very often they are paid by, by their employers. And then you have the resources. All you need is an opportunity. For the great majority of Chinese people, including the ones who work in these multinational companies, that's really not the case. You have to be much more careful. Right. You have to be much more impatient. Well, given that, and let me challenge you a bit. Right. So you say the foreigners get the opportunities. On the other hand, foreigners are leaving China mm -hmm. because of COVID or being replaced by very smart Chinese who studied abroad and can do exactly the same job with a, let's say, a relatively cheaper price. They still, right. It's more, like, more expensive still, but you know, they, they're getting cheaper basically. So is it not that foreigners are actually getting less opportunities? And related to that, many foreigners are saying, and you hear in the news all the time, oh, China's not welcome to foreigners anymore. Right. How do you see that? The way I see it is, I mean, uh, whoever is watching this video now, I hope that you watched the previous video with Han Lin. Uh, basically, do you remember how he said that uh, investors follow capital and uh, capital follows return? And it's the same thing with human capital. So wherever you get the, the, the biggest return on your talent, that's where you go. Now, if you look at why foreigners came to China over the last, let's say, 20 years since, well, first of all, that's how long I have been in China, but also that's, I came to China a year after the, uh, China's accession to the World Trade Organization, huge reform and development, gearing up to the Olympics and so on. Just go online and check for example, the HSBC Expat Explorer Survey or something like Internation. So every year they publish data about why foreigners go to every single country, like why, why expats like countries, and they rank these countries according to their attractiveness. You look at China, very consistent. Expats come to China because, number one, the economic development basically pulls them up, like, you know, like you are a skier and, uh, or like, like a water ski, basically. So it, for a very long time, if you're with automotive sales, chemical, pharmaceutical sales, you managed to get out of bed, you managed to, to, to turn up at the office, you made money. So this is number one. Number two, because the disposable income was quite good. So the, the difference between what you made and what you spent, very, very nice. And the third, China gave an enormous boost to your career. Yeah. It, it, it increased your responsibilities, area of responsibility, how much money you invested, how big a territory you managed, tenfold, how many people you managed. And then you find out the reason why expats are leaving China now are exactly the same reasons. Exactly the same reasons why they came in just now. It's a different kind of investment opportunity, right? And many, many foreigners are actually much more loyal to China than you would, you would expect. It's, it's difficult to leave China because it's a very specific environment. You get comfy here, you get, you get familiar with it. And then suddenly you realize, wait a minute, if I repeat it, exactly as you said, Sven, 
in, in, in the China of tomorrow, my experience about China 10 years ago, not so useful anymore. But in Indonesia, in India, in Mexico, I can recreate the same corporate success story because there it's also a lot of eager and unemployed people, early infrastructure development and relatively high uh, economic growth in comparison to economies like, I don't know, Switzerland, United States, uh, Japan. Yeah, I think it's a really important point for the audience, you know, why expats uh, had enjoyed China for so long. I mean, your, your book's called The Golden Age of Expats. That's an interesting phrase, too, because you talk to people who've been here 30 years, they think the golden age was the 90s, right? And they know, I've been here uh, about, about 16 years, and I think the golden age is, I don't know, late 2000s or something. Mm -hmm. And it, it's very interesting. Um, but, you know, we do suspect that uh, everything you talked about, the opportunities, the uh, growth, the optimism won't be coming back. Does it also mean that when they say China doesn't welcome foreigners anymore, are they saying, well, because I have now less opportunity, China doesn't like me anymore, but is it also then saying, I forgot to adjust to the new China? Mm. Because I see a lot of people who are actually leaving China, they become all various on a lot of anti-China right. because they lost their job, whatever. It's a very interesting, a very dynamic, I think. Do you know who are the best examples of this? Journalists. And this is where China now made it. very uh, critical. Sorry? <laughs> now I become very uh, controversial. No, listen. Um, I mean, journalists are an extreme case of what you're saying now, but I'm going to come to business people as well. China made an enormous mistake giving trouble to international journalists. Mm -hmm. Because now there are, in the world, there are thousands of thousands of very influential people. And since they were based in China for a long time, when anybody wants opinions about China, these are the people they, they contact. But now they are all over the world because their visa was not renewed, exactly the mentality that you mentioned. And those people are on a personal vendetta mm. to say bad things about China. And this is why the narrative is completely skewed. Now, I meet, I coach, I advise people on both ends. So I advise people and coach people who are high-level executives in an industry which is doing spectacularly well in China right now. So they are still living in this world as if it was 2008. Because in, in chemical pharmaceutical industry, if you run a large law firm, for example, everybody needs your services right now, certain sectors of automotive. And then they are going to look at you and they say, expat exodus, those people are stupid. Um, recession in China, what are you talking about? But that's not the majority. So you have to look at the data, for example, uh, coming out of AmCham, coming out of European Chamber, German Chamber, and, and lots of others. I also like publications by the Benelux Chamber. That is a minority in China right now. It's still there. It's still very important for, for business, but it's a minority. And then we have to look at how about everybody else, right? How about, how about those, those companies that have a large history in China, a, a very long history, but now they are basically not making money, either because they are outcompeted by their local competitors, or the regulatory environment changed that much, or because you simply cannot run those industries without foreigners, like international think tanks, research organizations, international business programs for universities. You are not going to run uh, those without international experts. And what you see there is those companies that are still here, they are trying to make ends meet. By the way, if you think that many companies are leaving China, just wait, because behind the scenes, um, as opposed to those companies that rushed out in a little bit of a panic, many, many respected international firms are slowly building their de-risking strategy, you know, which is not going to um, get to the news, but is going to happen eventually. And if you look at new investment, that's where the real problem is. Because basically now it's very, very difficult to convince international decision makers who haven't lived in China to go in now. This is a good pivot to uh, maybe a bigger pic picture question uh, from all the people you've talked to, especially European business involved in China. I mean, what's your prognosis about EU-China business relations? Uh, you, know, it, you know, how far will the risk can go? You know, what's it going to look like in a couple of years? Extremely difficult to tell because European decision makers... Now, part of the story is that recently I started shuttling between Europe and, uh, and China. So um, for a very long time, I was based in Shanghai. I flew everywhere to make keynotes, to coach people, to train people, to deliver workshops, including in Europe. And now I spend about half, half uh, in both places. 
And uh, European decision makers I meet in Europe are basically on the fence about China. What they say is, we don't know what's going to happen there. So we are building plan B, C, D strategies in case this and that and the other thing. And you can hear some crazy stories there because let's face it, China worked long and hard to build this kind of uh, fence of information. So very few people who don't speak Chinese know what the hell is happening in the country. And being on the fence is not good because if you look at large corporations, they can work with Saudi Arabia, it's no problem. They can work with Colombia. What they cannot work with is unpredictability. When, when they don't know what is going to happen two or three steps down and, and neither the Chinese government nor regulators nor international, uh, uh, how do you say, internationally trained Chinese people help an awful lot right now for the rest of the world to understand China. But I don't predict any kind of disastrous uh, decoupling. I don't think so. I, I, you know, if you look at the diplomatic and economic community in the recent, let's say, two years, and if you, if you speed it up, it's almost like a TV interview where the Western world said uh, decoupling, I'm, I mean de-risking. So they took a, took a huge step back and they took a couple of steps forward. China and, and Europe both know they need each other. They are very, very heavily cross-invested, much more cross-invested than most people know. So um, starting from, let's say, Chinese interest in companies like Mercedes-Benz and and also uh, uh, Chinese state-owned companies being incorporated all over the world and, and, and whatnot. So there is a very, very huge dependence here. And then I think there is also a big difference between the, the zeitgeist, the general mood in Europe and the United States, is European decision makers are much more aware of the flaws of the European system than Americans are of the American system here and, 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 and how compatible the two, uh, well, I work with corporations. I'm not, I'm not a, an economist like you. I work with the human level. But basically, two in, uh, European executives told me China and Europe is like a zipper, you know, with these little cogs mm. supporting each other. And when you close it, then it's, then it's unbreakable. But when you open it up, then the whole thing just doesn't make sense. Great. Anything left to add, Sven? I think we should wrap up now, but any final questions or I think, comments? I think there are lots of questions to ask. Yeah. We're running out of time, unfortunately. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, Thanks, Gabor. Always a pleasure to speak to you. Uh, we, you just spoke for us a couple months ago, so always to, right. good to see you again. And uh, I think it was a nice discussion. Yes. Yeah, thank, thank you very much. much. I, I do agree. Yeah. Yes, it was. To be continued, perhaps. Thank All you. right. Thank you for that. Thank you.